Parapreta Sanitation. Part 13. Resource-Oriented Waste, Water and Soil Management. The thing is now to find ways to bring economy in a way that it is also improving the situation in the local communities. Today, business is sucking out the local communities, the local economy. Uh, the, the global economy is sort of booming, uh, but uh, local economy is getting weaker and weaker because people do less and less by themselves. They have to pay more and more to the outside by higher fertilizer prices, higher prices for fuel, uh, and so on. And uh, so this development, if this goes on, we write off half of the world population. We say, let them die. And that's what is happening. And uh, I don't think that is, it's a good idea, not even for the rich ones, because we cannot live a happy life if we see that half of the world population is starving and uh, dying of hunger. And we fuel our car with the fuel that is, uh, could feed uh, 30 people. So there's, there's many, many things that are going completely wrong. And so now the idea is, how to bring this as a work as working business models for uh, rural areas, but also maybe for very urban and um, to to find new ways. And water plays a key role in this, as you all know. Otherwise, economy is impossible. Also, last week we had one statement um, that well, water is the base of economy, and that uh, I think that was Daniel from. Philippines who said that, and it's true for everywhere. It's, it's also true here, even we don't see that very much, because we think water is here anyway, but, well, it can be so polluted, it can be vanishing uh, when we um, act in a wrong way in the catchment area. All right, the, the outline of the class um, is that we look at water in a global context, so that's the general title. Uh, but then we look at the different issues, so rainwater management and rainwater harvesting. It's very, very important to increase water levels, to, to increase groundwater levels. Water and its utilization, and management of water is done more and more in a way of uh, integrated water resources management. It means catchment-wide activity, even crossing borders. Uh, as you know, many of the big rivers are crossing borders, and so if these countries are not cooperating, one country may take all the water, so that's a risk for Egypt, for example. So um, now when Sudan and uh, Ethiopia take more water, uh, that's a big risk, and actually now um, Ethiopia is building a huge, huge dam, one of the biggest dams of the world, the Grand Renaissance Dam, uh, that is, um, well, planned to make 12,000 gigawatts of, of electric power, which is just enormous. And this dam, they say, we only make hydropower for not having political trouble, but well, when it's done uh, and water is needed, uh, I think there will be some pipelines going to the region. And uh, so then Egypt will have even less water. Now they even overuse the system already. Uh, and um, this is something where we have to look at the um, river basin wide. <coughs> we will look at public health because this is something what has to do with our profession of uh, water engineering, in, in environmental engineering and so on. Sanitation and reuse. Uh, and sanitation actually um, is a very important uh, issue because sanitation has to do with water pollution but at the same time there's a potential for improving soil quality to improve water uptake by soil, and that is again rainwater harvesting, what is not called rainwater harvesting, but it's the best type of rainwater harvesting mm -hmm. because it's also increasing mm -hmm. agricultural yields. Uh, then we deal with soil quality, and uh, then in uh, connection to that with energy management, and uh, all these issues will have their own lecture. So we will, we will look at these issues in detail. And uh, all these issues are embedded in local economy, land use and agriculture, architecture and city planning. And in the, in the upper part, there is some issues that are here. Climate, ecology, population, culture, social issues, public and media, uh, 
politics, legislation, economy, and, uh, and a lot more. And uh, so that's something what makes uh, water so um, unique, that it's connected to almost everything, but still the water profession very often doesn't include all these issues. Of course there are issues about how society and water belong together, the issue of uh, poverty when uh, people have to pay a certain price for water that's very controversial often even going to fight and killings so there are frequent uh, for example in India there are frequent uh, riots uh, when water is diverted from a region and brought to the city instead uh, of being available for the local communities and uh, so that's something that doesn't make it to the headlines but this is happening uh, very very often all right so now the issue is on integrating sanitation, bio-waste management, uh, energy production and agriculture. And even though it seems that these issues are very far apart, I will show you that there are very, very strong connections and also very interesting economies in combining these. So for this lecture, I will start with the water key issues and soil is the first and make most important ones among it. I will deal with uh, innovative sanitation a bit, high-tech and low-tech, and finally a little bit on energy and bio-waste, and uh, that should be giving you an overview of the systems approach that I am following. So uh, first on our research at uh, TOHH, at my institute, we have uh, systems-based research we are product oriented, we don't want wastewater to waste water and spend a lot of money to clean it and then just throw it through the river, but we want to make products. So that may be reusable water, uh, fertilizer products, energy contents, soil improvement, uh, and so on. And there is a lot of interesting uh, options and that should be adapted to the local situation because we cannot just have general uh, technologies, but we have to look at the situation as it is and then adapt to it also in cooperation with the local communities, local authorities and the legislation given. We work with synergistic, multifunctional approaches. Each thing that only has one purpose is ill-defined. So we, we should really make multiple use of everything because everything costs money and if you have a system that is fulfilling two, three, four purposes, uh, we are always on the safe side. Then we work on innovative water, energy, soil technologies uh, to produce rich soil, also the terra preta soil, the carbon composting uh, techniques. And we work with high-tech and low-tech. And uh, what I find really sad is that very, very few research institutions are dealing with uh, uh, low-tech at all. Research seems always to be more technical solutions that are relatively costly and there's very little incentive for doing research on low-tech systems on very, very cheap solutions because also here there is no real driving force behind it. And NGOs are sleeping here because they're also following some way of thinking that is uh, more linked to old ways than to look at the new options. And all this should be done in a... Uh, and uh, for, for the research we are doing, there is our website and uh, there is a lot of uh, well, research project there, so when you want to do project work, masterpieces, <coughs> let us know, there's uh, a lot you can do, adapting to your wishes. And now, what are key issues? So soil is the most important thing for water. And uh, if we look at the world, as it can be seen from a satellite, we obviously see there is very, very different climatic regions, there is very, very different situations, and uh, increasingly the climate is dominated by human activity. So we know about the spread out of the deserts, but now there are people that invert that. So the deserts are pushed back, activity by single 
people just people planting trees and neighbors copying they have more yield in their agriculture so many many people join in and the whole big region in west africa has been greened the rain has come back it can be done and uh, that's something where there is a lot of uh, options and uh, that's something where i want to make you aware of the great opportunities so this is the, the water scarcity projections and uh, water scarcity is not a sort of uh, God-given thing but it has to do with mismanagement of water, overusing the resources. It also has to do with not adapting to the climatic situation that is growing cotton in areas where water is scarce, doesn't make any sense. So it would make more sense to make crops that are not so demanding on water or to grow rice in a dry way and not wet rice cultivation. Even the water-rich Java in Indonesia has turned to water scarcity because of all this rice production. It's ridiculous. They have meters of rain every year and still they run into water scarcity in the dry season. Isn't that incredible? And now, looking at uh, the root causes of water or limit, limited water resources and that's very often the soil quality the natural soil quality but also the soil quality that is uh, influenced by human activity and that's the big tragedy at the moment that soils are degraded at a large extent so there are some comments here from nature save our soils uh, from Germany, our, the president of our environmental agency, Jochen Flassbart, who really understood this issue. We lose the soil, he's saying. In Germany, uh, around 80,000 square kilometers have become unusable over the last 30 years, and only 25,000 could be gained. And if we look globally, the UN Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report has shown that we have strongly deteriorated or destroyed one third of all arable soil around the world. One third. So this means we are eating up our future or the future of our children without even seeing that. It's not on the headlines. It's not something that makes it to the news and uh, this is something which shows a society that is uh, behaving like a <coughs> mentally ill person. <coughs> Unfortunately, industrial type <coughs> agriculture, it is business <coughs> selling products and industrial agriculture tends to destroy the humus layer and uh, in the long run doesn't, doesn't become obvious so fast, so it takes some decades and now the time has come where many areas go out of production, their yields are getting less and less, they put more and more fertilizers, more and more pesticides, but then when the soil life is dead, uh, the soil is compacting, water uptake is getting less and less and so uh, it's sort of a downward spiral and this is uh, happening in many parts of the world now, including Germany. Very rich, good soils can stand this uh, mistreatment for maybe some decades, but um, this comes to an end in uh, many areas. And also then bioenergy is also something where soil is very often misused and destroyed in a very short time span. Another statement from UN, humankind produces 23 hectares of desert every minute. To just imagine in the time we've been sitting here how, how many hectares these are and uh, well one hectare can uh, feed quite a few people. Now a statement that took me 20 years for myself to understand and this is good soil makes water. And please remember this, even if you think it's foolish that I repeat this so often, uh, it's still a thing that very, very few people understand. But I meet more and more who 
come to the same conclusions. Also now in Indonesia, there were people who have uh, worked in the same direction. Good soil prevents drought and flooding. Why is that? Because good soil can soak up lots of water. And there is an incredible number, what I don't have here on the slide, but what you may remember, one square meter of rich humus soil can absorb 150 liters of water in one hour. This is, uh, this is 150 millimeters in a, in a compacted soil. This is flooding. In a very rich soil, this is just absorbing water and storing water to the aquifer, to the groundwater. And this is something where uh, this statement makes a lot of sense. And why preventing drought? Because this water is not washed off, increasing ero erosion, but this water goes to the groundwater and in times of drought it is still there. And also <coughs> good soil holds this water for many, many weeks, even long enough so that the crops can get ripe without irrigation. So we can have a lot more rain-fed agriculture when we keep our soil uh, intact or improve the soil quality. So flooding can be fun too. <laughs> but uh, maybe we don't want that too often. This is an actual picture from Jakarta. This happened just a few weeks back. And uh, this is also showing that um, well, urban drainage is, uh, is an important issue. And the good thing is, good soil also makes more food and also better food quality and gives more income to local farmers. <coughs> so, uh, the type of agriculture that goes this direction is organic agriculture because organic agriculture tends to improve soil. It's their main issue to improve soil as much as they can. And this is difficult. It takes so long to improve soil quality. And uh, so you need lots of organic matter to do that. And in many areas, especially in, in African countries, the soil is so barren that, that very little biomass is produced. So you get very little to add to the soil. So there's a challenge. And uh, bio waste management and sanitation can help with that, as I will show you. And uh, organic agriculture is growing strongly. The demand on the market is uh, very, very strong. So it is economically very, very uh, competitive. Um, still, uh, it's not, well, a big proportion of, um, of agriculture. But if you see, this is the graph here of, uh, uh, this is the graph of uh, the rise of, uh, organic agriculture worldwide and so the tendency is clear and this is good news for water management because water utilities very often support organic farmers in the catchment so that they don't have all the nitrate that they have less pesticides in the water and that the, the soil is uh, well absorbing more water so this is good policies and uh, especially Germany has gone uh, uh, very strongly in this direction so then about the yield, very often there is the thinking that organic farms are having less yield. And now there is in the uh, UK, there is a farm that uh, compares organic farming with industrial or chemical farming uh, since around 150 years. And uh, so their yield, organic, chemical, it's almost the same. It's over, this, these numbers are over 30 years, and they do this since 150 years. The total profits, however, organic, $1,300 per hectare a year. The chemical farm, because they have so high expenses for fertilizers, prices incri increasing more and more like energy, they only have uh, 470 or something. And then also energy usage, organic farming needs around one third less energy input and this is also saving fossil fuels like less diesel uh, needed. So this is from uh, Rodeo Institute 
and they have the same plots, organic chemical, uh, to observe uh, the differences. So now one issue that is uh, extremely interesting. So this is the actual um, journal of uh, Water 21 from IWA, International Water uh, Association. And uh, its title, really, rice production. And I will show you something on rice production. I will not cite this article. It's just showing how important this is for water management. Rice cultivation in a wet cultivation way requires very, very much water. It's obvious. There is water with large surface areas, hot climate, evaporation, and the water is just disappearing. And why are people cultivating rice wet? It's mainly about weed control. So if they uh, we can open a window maybe a little bit with so many people. Uh, could you open that one maybe? Um, what is this? Is that anymore? Uh, weed control is the upside of the flooding, but at a too high, too high cost. Uh, rice doesn't really like to be submerged. That was surprising for me, but it has to put a lot of effort into building snorkels to survive in a submerged uh, cultivation. And uh, that costs a lot of yield, because when they have to build snorkels, they put less into the production of rice. And um, so if you cultivate rice dry, what is their natural type of growing, uh, they will have more yield and they will, will uh, use a lot less water. And then there's another trick that was found in Indonesia not so long ago. If you leave more space for the rice plant, you can have a lot more yield on one plant. And this is called a uh, system of rice intensification. And uh, if you look at this, uh, <coughs> this is from one grain of rice. From one grain of rice. <coughs> and uh, this is the yield from one grain. From one grain. Imagine, normally you would have a little bit of a handful and a system of rice intensification, one single grain makes a half, half a kilo of rice. With less water, without pesticides, without fertilizer, but with a lot of <coughs> compost, humus, you must work on the soil. You must have organic matter and that can be bio waste, for example. I don't like too much to put excreta there too fast, that's a different issue. But organic waste, agricultural waste, kitchen waste can be processed. And these farmers that are following the system, they have triple the yield of the chemical farms. Triple the yield with a lot less water, with a lot less expensive uh, expenditure, and with uh, a lot less environmental damage because they don't put fertilizers and pesticides. And this is so amazing, and uh, at the same time, it's growing on a sort of grassroots level. This organization is organized as NGO. They do a lot of trainings. I will so show you some pictures. Uh, so the basic idea, less can give more. So wider spacing, nine plants on a square meter. And um, this supports a healthy plant, because when the plant can really develop, there is a lot of humus in the soil. Uh, it will be uh, living a lot better. And uh, this is minimizing competition between the different plants because otherwise they are like when we are in a, uh, in a train squeeze, we don't like that, so we are not feeling well. And the same with plants. If they can develop, they are happy, they are staying healthy a lot easier. Of course, pest control is still an issue. I don't say this is uh, some, some uh, thing that works by itself. So knowledge is needed. Organic farming is more difficult than the chemical type. And that's why they do these trainings. 
and this is one of the training classes. And this guy there, he was really great. He was talking in local language, not even in Indonesian, but in a local <coughs> language. And people were laughing all the time, and he was showing examples of the different stages of growth. And um, then I, I, I was also asked to come forward to talk to them. That was translated, and they were very happy to have me there because they want to have more attention to this. And they now have around 20,000 hectares under this type of cultivation, what is a lot for this method that is now spreading very fast, but very little compared to the millions of hectares in industrial cultivation. So some pictures from this uh, recent visit. And uh, actually, this is the wider spacing. And these are young plants, so they, they will develop like this. And uh, the man in the uniform, this, uh, he's the farmer. He's soldier at the same time. Yeah. He was uh, actually saying, we should do this in the army because people have so much time, they hang around. <laughs> they should be trained in this because many are farmers. And also reforestation, he's really having, having nice ideas. And when he started this, so he made this compost. So this is the compost. This is the, that was, Impressive. So we turned around the compost, and well, you, you may not see this very well. There are hundreds of worms, and in, in, in system intensification, they have a minimum requirement, and that is 120 worms per square meter. This is a minimum requirement. Conventional agriculture has destroyed the worms, so our best helpers are killed. Soil is compacting because they don't aerate it anymore. Water is not coming in, flooding, erosion. And then we have headlines, flooding in Australia again. Now, why? Because people are stupid. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, they're often not to be blamed because they study industrial agriculture and they learn it is like this, but then 20 years later they realize they have been cheated. Like in Senegal, where I'm, I'm a consultant to a farmer, 25 years after he started this type of rice cultivation, he had no earthworms anymore. And uh, it's a um, sign, alarming sign. Uh, and so uh, it's not so easy to have enough material, but in tropical areas there is a lot growing. So it's more easy in tropical areas, more difficult in uh, dry areas in uh, other regions of the world. And. Uh, this is another li uh, like uh, combination that is that I like very much. So at the University of Bandung in uh, Indonesia, they also work on rice cultivation in pots. And now look at this one rice plant, and I showed you one plant, half a kilo of rice, just one plant. So that can be done in backyards. But Indonesia doesn't have backyards very much. Indonesia has roofs. <laughs> every every uh, area that is inhabited is filled with roofs, nothing else. And so we discussed a little bit of the options and so uh, came up with a suggestion to build a house with a roof garden. And the same spice is available uh, a little bit higher. And then you could grow a lot of plants and uh, put the rice pots there and the family could make around say 20 to 30 percent of their own uh, vegetables and rice and at the same time making the region more beautiful space for children to play on the roof instead of the dangerous road where all the scooters are racing <laughs> and uh, at the same time uh, because the houses are very very dense uh, we could have like uh, rows of bamboo between the houses for fencing and at the same time for grey water treatment. So the wastewater could be treated on site, producing fuel from bamboo and shade and beauty. So that's some of the ideas we're following. And uh, now a little bit about the behavior of plants. So the behavior of rice in this rice intensification is not all that surprising if you know a little bit more about soil and how plants behave. Unfortunately, this is not in agricultural science. They ignore this because there is a driving force be behind agriculture that is the agro-industry. It's very obvious, so they are sort of uh, setting the agenda in most universities. There are a few universities that are going for organic agriculture 
but even they are sort of not knowing the well, things behind the scene. And that is something where we can ask the plants what they prefer. <laughs> and uh, this is like a little experiment. And uh, so there is a pot, a plant, and this is the best chemical agro soil that you can have. That's everything. Even trace elements are brought in. Uh, NPK mineral fertilizer in optimum supply. So the dream of the chemical farmer. On the other hand, the dream of the organic farmer with lots of humus, as I said, it's not so easy to rise humus content. Uh, but uh, there is also some stone powder, so this gives trace elements and so on. And without mineral fertilizer. So the left hand side is more expensive to be cultivated. And now look where the plant goes. Just like that. So why are we spending so much money to give plants a hard time to survive, to kill earthworms and so on? So this is something what is, uh, well, a bit strange and linked to bio-waste management and sanitation in a way that these are all the organic substances that could improve the soil structure. So now there is something, it, it becomes even weirder. There is a thing that is uh, called endocytosis. Anybody heard of endocytosis? You did in biology actually, because in biology it's something normal that uh, cells are sort of um, permeable to uh, to other uh, well so, other uh, other cells, and so that's endocytosis in biology. And, uh, but there's also endocytosis in plants. And there is really good research about this, but also this doesn't make it to the uh, profession of agriculture, uh, because it's uh, sort of making the concept of mineral fertilizer very questionable. And in fact, plants are just like our gut system, uh, can take in bacteria. So sorry for you vegetarians, plants are not vegetarians, they eat bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they can also work with mineral fertilizer, but it's difficult for them. They have to work hard to make something out of these molecules. When they have, can have big building blocks, they would prefer that, and that would be bacteria and like debris of organic matter. And uh, so there's a recent publication on this uh, from Look at the universities here. University of Queensland, uh, University of Bern in Switzerland, uh, and uh, very respected organizations. And they made this type of research with up-to-date uh, equipment, and they could observe live bacteria that were taken up by roots and actually living in the plant. So the plant was taking it up alive so they are not only not vegetarians, but they are swallowing their prey um, life. And then they digest it. And there are some consequences also for sanitation. So if wastewater, untreated wastewater, comes to plants, they take up the coli. It goes into the plants, even alive. And then imagine uh, lettuce, where all the water evaporates, more and more bacteria come in. So this can be uh, pretty disgusting. We must know this. It's known to hardly anybody. Strangely, these publications are there, and there's more like that. <coughs> and so we should know that. We have scandals like uh, EHEC and things like that. That's a clear pathway uh, where this can come to people. Very, very important for public health. And for plant behavior, of course. And uh, now a few words about the different types of uh, cultivation and uh, intensification of um, yields. Um, this graph is showing um, the intensity of cultivation and energy demand. And of course, we want to have high intensity. We want to have high yields. Many people want to eat. 
And on the other hand, we want to have low energy input. So both things up there are not so interesting because they are sort of wasting resources. And of course, up there we have the, the meat production requires large areas, large uh, amounts of energy for working the whole system and uh, the losses from converting something uh, that could be food for humans to food of animals. I, I like to eat meat, organic meat only, but uh, I do eat meat. So meat production is a part of organic agriculture, but not this type of uh, like having um, 20,000 animals in, in small cages. This is not, not acceptable in my point of view. And it's also not acceptable from the point of view of resources efficiency, because that is a waste of resources. And uh, then also we have, uh, up there we have uh, the big wheat fields, wheat production in a very intensive way. It's not really very efficient all in all. But then it gets better with potato, wet rice, and then the dry rice would go here somewhere. It's not in this graph. And then there is some very interesting uh, area here where there are amazing yields and uh, very, very little energy input. And this is the type, like the rice intensification program, uh, this is a type of gardening culture that is there traditionally also in Europe. And the same thing, what they do with rice in Indonesia has been done in uh, Norway from farmers that put the grains of, of ray and wheat also very far apart and they get the same. They get very, very big plants that are highly productive. And now in Ethiopia, uh, I learned something about uh, another type of rain. Is this is getting too much. You, you can absorb this. Just show up when something is unclear or getting too much. I can also skip some things. Um, there is one specific grain that is only grown in Ethiopia. It's teff. And teff is a, more a grass. It's the finest grain in the world. It's so fine that you cannot really polish it. What is good, it's always full grain. And um, it is gluten free. So when we look around, like 50, 60, 70 percent of us will have some sort of uh, gluten allergy, knowingly or unknowingly. So very many people have wheat allergies and uh, things like that. And um, the other ones have milk allergies. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's good to look at that also. And one way to get away from that is to have gluten-free uh, food. And it's very expensive and hardly available. Rice is gluten-free, so very nice. Uh, and then teff is gluten-free. And um, <coughs> There were programs from, uh, like from Germany to get people in Ethiopia away from TEF because the yield is relatively low. And now, at that time, I thought, yeah, good idea. But now I think, well, they are stupid. They want to get them away from something that is so healthy. And if you look at Ethiopians, they are really slim and strong and healthy. They all eat injera from TEF. Uh, it is uh, non-polished because it's impossible to polish. And it's always gluten free. So these people are so healthy. And that's their, their main base food. So there's a strong link. Uh, in many other African countries, obesity is a, is a big issue uh, because people have followed the European style of, of, of nutrition. And now TEF is going to Holland, to the US, as a very expensive uh, thing. And I met somebody uh, on my journey who was now making a different type of um, Teff production, and guess what he did? Wider spacing. Mm -hmm. Normally they seed just like that, and with these fine seeds, the plants grow everywhere, they are stressed, they don't have a good yield. And now he makes uh, rows, 20 centimeter rows, he's still developing seeding machinery, but it's not very easy. He still doesn't know if he will succeed, his grains are just too fine. But he has tripled the yield, just for wider spacing. And these things are really uh, so incredible. And 
always they depend on good humus soil. And the project where this man is working in is uh, together with the Swedish agency, they want to bring together sanitation and um, soil cultivation there with this TEF production. So there's a lot going on, but on a relatively small scale still. All right. This clear at least a little bit. So now, something about how high yields can be. This is big hope for urban agriculture. As you know, urban agriculture is becoming a big issue. We find nice reports on uh, urban agriculture in New York, on high-rise buildings, in backyards, and on abandoned land. And also in Hamburg we have some projects. And there is one man in Norway, Herbig Pomeresche, who has written the book Humus Ferbe. And uh, he makes very, very much humus by feeding the soil directly. He's not composting, but he is sort of grinding his bio waste, putting it to the soil directly. And what he's producing is, since many years, he's taking accurate uh, accounts of it. He makes 18 kilograms of onion on one square meter. 18 kilograms. The so normal yield is two or three kilograms in industrial agriculture. I haven't visited yet, I want to do this soon, so uh, I will tell you more when I have been there. But he's done this really since a long time and now I know people knowing him, so he's really serious. And uh, so that is, we can do a lot more. So feeding many people is not so difficult, but we need to know how. And for you to train people how to do that and at the same time uh, improving water quality and water retention in the catchment area. So there, all these links are there. Also in urban areas, if there is more urban agriculture, there is retention of rainwater. It's rainwater harvesting at the same time. <coughs> A few words on uh, micronutrient efficiencies. Who has checked the blood? Have you checked your blood for deficiencies of trace elements? Who has done that ever? Nobody. Do you know how your body works? <laughs> we don't work, learn that at school much, don't we? That's, uh, if we have lack of essential trace elements, we cannot be really healthy. That is clear. That's what we learned. But then nobody follows up that we check our blood from time to time. When I did, I had a copper deficiency. I didn't know that, it's very strange. Uh, so it was easy to complement. And uh, very, very many people have zinc deficiencies. And why is that? Where, where do these elements come from? From nutrition, from our food. Where does our food grow? On the soil. <laughs> Half of the arable soils around the world have zinc deficiencies. Half. And now you may say, well, zinc, I don't need zinc. But zinc is the ammunition of our immune system. If we have deficiency of zinc, we can never be really strong when there is some illness going around. We are the first one ones to, uh, to stay home and go to bed. So a good, strong immune system requires zinc, for example. And uh, this is something what is uh, hardly known. There was a lot of research two, three decades back. All this research has gone to the shelf, was not applied because you cannot make big money with it. There was one company actually of one of the people who was involved in that research and he was frustrated about uh, what happened. And, uh, he actually made a product with 21 elements and uh, he told me that there are around 40, 45 essential trace elements. 45. Just imagine. At school we learn about 16, 17, but there are 45. Luckily only around 20 can become deficient and uh, worldwide deficiencies are zinc, Boron, molybdenum, uh, copper, uh, um, 
so this I will give this around and you can have a look which ones uh, are important. Some very normal elements, uh, but it should be checked that soil has that and then the plants will have it, then we will have it and we will be more healthy. And there's one strange thing in all this issue. What is now once again ma making this weirder? So you can blame me for not sticking to the topic, but it doesn't matter. Public health is part of water management. Uh, very, very many of us do have vitamin D deficiencies. There's excellent research about the enormous role of vitamin D. Yeah, too little sunshine. That's yeah, it. it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in countries with a winter climate, you cannot have enough vitamin D over winter except to complement. It's very simple. This is vitamin D3. It must be D3. D2 doesn't work. And uh, that's something. When you take this, you don't have more illness in winter than in summer. Works nicely. It's not expensive. And uh, so take care of that. And now we may think pe people living in uh, very sunny climates, they wouldn't have that problem. But what do they do? Shielding off from the sunshine, uh, then uh, staying indoors all the time. The car is parked in the garage, so people don't go to the sunshine anymore. And like in Qatar, there's one of the students who was here a few years back, he works in Qatar now, and he says there is a very, very, very high percentage, especially among women, that have osteoporosis. And that's also linked to vitamin D deficiency. So imagine the, the sun richest country in the world and they don't have enough vitamin D. And uh, so watch out for that. That's uh, crucial information. You can check the internet for that. Um, the evidence is, is there very clearly. And of course, well, checking a blood test like that, it costs like 150 euros or something. Mm -hmm. It's really worth doing that. So this is these essential elements. You can all have this. I will put this to IP, this presentation, so we will have this information. And uh, actually, we also put this to compost. Because also a compost must be healthy. Also compost needs all the trace elements, otherwise it's not a compost. Um, so now, change of topic. <laughs> Are there questions for the rest? We will deal with the issues in, in the different classes in more detail, but this is just for giving an overview. And uh, now, what you should remember, the rice. You can grow rice without water. And it's better, can give more yield, and uh, you can also uh, well, get away from water, water scarcity in areas where rice is cultivated. So Java could switch easily and not having water scarcity anymore, becoming a rice exporter again. Now they are importing because their yields are also going down. And uh, this is uh, good news. And now, that also would be part of rainwater harvesting because when we uh, have less evaporation, we bring more rainwater into the ground or keep it there. So, uh, rainwater harvesting is working on the uh, catchment area, also storage and reservoirs. You may have heard of uh, big dams, but there are also small dams, track dams, and so on. And it also includes a delivery system. And uh, the best way of uh, rainwater harvesting, and that's not even in the textbooks, <laughs> is having soil with plants. And this is, unfortunately, this picture is not very good. I, I just took a photograph from a book. Uh, the part of soil that has a root system is very, very much more suitable for absorbing rainwater. So when vegetation is gone, the soil will harden, and when it rains, the rain washes off. When there are plants, then there's a much higher uptake of water in the region. And that's, uh, in my point of view, one of the most um, important uh, things in 
rainwater harvesting. As I said, it's not addressed so far. So good soil is rainwater harvesting. And trees play an important role. In those areas of the world where sunshine is abundant, we, we need to have trees on the fields. We will have better yields and better soil, and we can have more products. I will show you in a minute. So that soil will be like a sponge, and it takes up water. And once again, I will show you. Um, yeah, this is not. So this is good soil with roots and plants. And so let's. So this is retention. Runs for quite a long time, isn't it? And this is the 150 liters per square meter that we can take up in good soil. And that's the same amount of water that would otherwise be flooding. So the difference between flooding and a good rain that is storing, restoring our aquifers is not very big. There was a big uh, flooding in uh, uh, Algeria very recently, uh, they, had, they had around 100 meters per square meter over 24 hours and that was a major flooding with a lot of uh, damage. So also the economy is suffering from that with all having roads that are broken and so on. So uh, compacted and no plants, flooding erosion. And now the biggest enemy of soil, the goats. <laughs> goats are simply too good at eating everything. When you have too many goats, the soil is lost. They don't even only eat the plant, but they eat the root, everything, they tear out everything. And uh, goats are sort of the main income for the poor people because they just go around with goats, the goats are grazing. And when there are too many people with too many goats, everything is going to be eroding. No more plants growing. So nobody has any yield anymore. So it's not a good idea for the society. But individually, we would do the same. If I would have goats, I would try to have as many as possible to have milk, to have meat, to have income, to send my, uh, uh, my children to school. It's very obvious why people do that. But it's, it's a dead end road. Where authorities should take action, and there are some really, really nice things that are possible. And uh, one is to prevent logging in a way. You see, uh, there is trees cut down, and in the far of the picture, you see the mountain ranges that don't have trees anymore. So that's the startup of erosion. So when we lose the trees in the mountain ranges, that's an alarm sign. And this is probably illegal logging. So they will just go everywhere, cut down everything, move away as fast as possible, and if police would come, they would be far away already. That's going on in every place in the world, and many people are even paying bribes to the authorities for not being catched. And uh, this is part of the tragedy. The goats, the logging, and agricultural practices that are not really sustainable. And now, uh, unfortunately, a lousy picture was getting dark a little bit already uh, from Ethiopia, erosion going on. Ethiopia is among the most eroded countries worldwide. They have many mountain ranges and uh, at the same time, this is around Aba Minch. Uh, there's Aba Minch University and we, we work with that university closely. And um, at the same time, if you, if you go uh, like two hours south, you come to Konzo, and Konzo is a region where the people have adapted to a very dry climate, and they have introduced quite a few very interesting techniques. One of the techniques is, of course, terracing. Like in many parts of the world, wise cultures have terraced their soil. And uh, so making a, a little dam, this was eroded. This was an eroded place, completely gone. Worth nothing. 
and even the goats wouldn't find much there. <laughs> and now these guys have uh, made this uh, this dam. And where did this soil come from? Does it come by truck, by hand, by donkey car? Uh, it's well, it's it's good soil, relatively good soil. How would that collect there? Yes, by erosion. You make use of the erosion actually, and uh, by catching the soil, the erosion is losing its damage because the soil is kept back, and this is actually very fertile. And this soil behind the dam will hold water. It's water retention at the same time. So this is, uh, well, a, uh, a very good exercise of creating value. This land is really, really valuable. Before it was worth nothing. And this is what I mean, that we should make economic uh, use of, of ideas. So people who develop this, they can make money by doing this, uh, either by settling themselves or by making people aware of how doing this. And now I have some ideas that uh, even increases this idea. And uh, so that's the technique from conventional rainwater harvesting technique, making check dams. Where would you start if you have a highly eroded area? So a hilly range and soil is washing out and you want to start somewhere. So now, if we build, you, you saw that, plant trees to stabilize this. So maybe even there is one uh, very, very heavy rain uh, once in 50 years that even would wash away everything. So we need trees to stabilize. And when we make trees, we should choose trees that are making fodder and food. And there are some very, very nice ones, not so many. One of the nicest worldwide, actually, is this one that I have in the picture here. Who knows that tree? I don't see that so easily. It's Moringa. Moringa tree. And Moringa is one of the best trees in the world because it can be uh, used for feeding the goats. So the idea would be make terraces, plant, for example, Moringa. The goats are put to cages <laughs> and they will be fed with wonderful moringa and they can eat up to 40% moringa as their main nutrition and so this would solve uh, several problems at the same time and would be economically feasible because trees are very very productive and then How could the moringa tree or, or neem tree could be done and uh, also fodder <coughs> and you could produce etheric oils from neem, very high price, so also local income. And for starting the tree, we need compost and that comes from sanitation. So there, terra sanitation comes in because if you plant a tree somewhere in a barren area, eroded area, it will not grow. And so the idea is to make a, a big batch of compost and when you start uh, planting trees, this will be something where we have, uh, say, a good uh, heap of compost and the tree will grow nicely. And the good choice of tree, Moringa, Neem, uh, also Anato, I'll show you in a minute. And then, um, the interesting thing in uh, Moringa tree, is that it's not only fodder for goats, but it's almost the best food we can have as humans. Uh, I've actually eaten in, in Ethiopia, I've eaten Moringa without knowing it. So I thought it's uh, mango, Swiss chard, or spinach, something in between there. It's really nice. It's cooked, very, very nice food. And then we talked to the owner of the place, and he said, oh, oh you just ate Moringa. And that was cool because it's so nice and the nutrition value is very, very high and you can conserve it by drying. Very simple local production, Moringa powder, very high price product, very highly nutritious. And uh, so if we have a system like this, we have uh, 
sort of a uh, preventive system for hard times. So just imagine there is a famine coming. Big drought, the region is not very far from there. People are dying of hunger. Not very far from that region. And these people still don't move. In Konso, this region, what I showed you, they do adapt. They have done some nice things, but elsewhere you don't see that. They don't learn from that. They even look down to the people who are uh, behaving better. And uh, so now, if there is, uh, we have these uh, trees for feeding the goats, so people have still have their goats. They don't do damage to the soil. Uh, still they have the income. They have additional income from making moringa powder, for example. They have some wood from the trees for fuel and construction. And uh, then imagine there is a disaster coming. No more food. What would they do? Eat the goats first. <laughs> Then the goat doesn't eat fodder anymore, and then people eat the moringa tree, the, the leaf. It's a very nice system of, of preventive care for disaster uh, situations. And why are politicians not addressing this? They, they are putting us to risk. We plant so many trees that are just ornamental, without any uh, nutritional value, and nature has all this. So in the northern climates we have the walnut tree or the chestnut trees, edible chestnuts, very, very good food. And this could be everywhere, like in Brussels, in the forests around Brussels, you have lots of um, chestnut trees, the edible ones, and in uh, autumn time, many people go around throwing sticks to get them down, and then you bake them, it's very, very nice food. And this could be here as well, and that's relatively little done. So, Moringa, then there is a tree that is producing cashew, uh, it's a very nice tree, and it produces an apple, many of them in the Philippines, uh, and uh, makes an apple and the cashew nut. Very nice, so good combination. Erosion prevention, food production, and uh, vitamin source, and so on. So, more ideas that are combining ecology and economy. All right, this would be the Moringa powder. And this is actually, I had these ideas and then I went to Conso and I saw people have done this since maybe hundreds of years. Because these are Moringa trees in the field, so combination of fields and tree cultivation. And uh, they overuse them a bit. If you see this poor tree, they cut everything, so they have too many goats, obviously. So now one other tree, and uh, I got some information that the Anato tree, uh, it's called the lipstick tree. So it makes a very good product, that's the today's application, they make uh, lipstick dye from that very nice color, uh, natural one. And, uh, but at the same time, this tree can be a nutrition base. The yield of such uh, uh, it can produce as much as a intensively cultivated wheat field. Just imagine, from trees. And in between, you could grow vegetables and everything. So another trick that would be available, and uh, that is not really looked at very much. And uh, when we went to the training center of Uni University of Surabaya in Indonesia, they had them in the park. So I was really thrilled, but they didn't know what to do with it. They knew about the, yes. the dye, but not about the nutrition value. In Costa Rica, we use it for cooking. Yeah. Ah, okay. It's yes. color okay. to the rice and yeah. to the food. But also for the color, not yeah. for the... No, no, well, it's, it's like a spice. Ah, like a spice, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it can also be like replacing wheat, replacing rice, and uh, so I think, but it would be interesting to hear how, how that is uh, prepared. Yeah, we cook it. Are you also cook it? The, the seeds or? For color. For color also. Yeah, yeah. We do like the meat, we do like the color. Okay. Yeah, we do that, we can do the seeds. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I actually don't know exactly how to make use of the nutritional value, but they are in. Yeah. Uh, I've heard some people who make a sort of uh, um, DAO from that. So it's also used as nutrition, but addition to something else. So the taste may not be so good to eat it uh, like just like that. Uh, but this would be interesting to. I, I didn't find, uh, find enough information only about the dye aspect, but not about the, the nutritional value so much. So more information, please email me. So now some of the um, <coughs> miracles going on in the world, and uh, there is the one uh, that I saw in a paper in. A, Le Monde Diplomatique, not very well known. And uh, this article was uh, talking about one man who had listened to his grandfather. The grandfather was telling him, whenever a little tree starts growing, make a little swale, a little bit of a swale, so when it drains, the water will run to the tree, and put some down of the goats. And of course, keep the goats away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he did that on his land. People laughed at him. The other men were sitting there, and this guy, what is he doing? He's, he's working there for nothing. And uh, but he didn't mind. He, he just went on. So after a few years, he had nice trees. His yield in vegetable cultivation was rising strongly because. Not only there was some shade, but there was also the roots improving the soil quality. Roots are very, very important for improving soil. They die off very often, so the fine roots are dying off after a few days, and then organic matter is remaining, so the soil is loosened, and this is a whole ecosystem. And uh, so when he has done that, and his yields were rising, and he, of course he had the uh, products from the trees. I don't. He probably didn't even have moringa. He would have been uh, even better off with moringa. Um, and uh, this was when people started to copy. And so then, a few years on, he was having his scooter and he was driving around telling people how to do that. And now this is a big, big, big movement, and a whole region has changed from one man. He got some support later on from NGOs and so on, but it was originally one man who had made a change. And uh, it's uh, in big regions of uh, southern Mali, uh, in uh, Bukin northern Burkina Faso, parts of uh, Niger. And uh, it has changed the climate. The rain is back. So we can always talk of climate change, but we can change <coughs> the climate to the better as well. And by the way, climate change, I think the influence of Soil degradation is far bigger than we think. CO2 is, well, it, it has its role, but it's overestimated heavily. And we lose options when we don't look for uh, some other causes like soil erosion. And then there is also the Lost Plateau in China. And there is a very nice film about that. And uh, that is also something that is very, very interesting. And only many more examples like that. So there's, uh, if you really watch for that, you will find some little stories. It's never on the headlines. <laughs> so then, dealing with water means that many regions are building dams. They say we have too little water in the dry season, so let's build a dam. Point one, when dams are built, we must check very well the trade-off. So many dams are only built for well, making big business for the consultants, for the uh, construction companies and the politicians uh, that are pushing that. Uh, so there are some dams that don't have a lot of advantages but only cost a lot of money. But if we look at the situation, there are many situations where also big dams have so many advantages that in total, they probably make good sense. And Ethiopia is now planning one of the biggest dams of the world, the Grand Renaissance Dam. And uh, this is one uh, that is... Uh, so these circles are indicating the power output uh, that these dams can have when they are ready. So look at Ashwan Dam. 
it's a huge one. It's uh, making almost all electricity for Egypt, a big country with a big population. So now imagine Grand Renaissance done, Ethiopia, how much power that can do. So they want to produce 12,000 gigawatt hours. No, gigawatts is power output. And uh, one strange thing is there is a dam already, the Grand Inga, that is existing. But there is a lot of war around, it's unstable region, so nobody does the investment for new generators. And this dam, just imagine, can produce 44, 44 gigawatts. This would be the biggest hydropower installation worldwide, and it's just not used. And now look at Germany putting all these solar panels here that do nothing in winter time. Mm. And if we would have invested in that, the whole of Africa would have power. Of course, there would uh, some blue helmet soldiers need to be there <laughs> <laughs> to prevent uh, sort of attacks. So it's three really, uh, unstable uh, region in Congo and around. Uh, but the idea would be to make these uh, desert tech ideas larger, so to make links between different parts of the world and make more use of the hydropower there. And uh, so that this could be very, very beneficial for all of uh, Europe and Africa combined. A few words about uh, biofuel. So there is a big subsidized move towards biofuel, in, uh, especially in Germany. Uh, we all pay this with our electricity bills. And I like the idea originally, but what they made out of that now is a disaster, probably the, be the biggest environmental disaster that we had since decades. And that is all these biogas plants with uh, corn or mice for uh, producing energy from food, what is strange in itself, but the yield is so low that it's basically ridiculous from the beginning. It doesn't make any sense. Because the net energy output, if you include the soil degradation, is below zero. It actually destroys energy. <coughs> and uh, then, now, another picture from uh, Indonesia. Look at this biosolar. What is that? At a filling station, gas station, what is that? Biodiesel, yeah, biodiesel from palm oil. Yeah. And now these palm oil plantations, they eat up huge areas where food can be grown. Mm. And we made a rough estimate, when you operate one car, the other option would be to feed 30 people. In a world with hunger, it is prohibitive to put biofuel into cars, I think. So, now, so you're still with me? <laughs> you will get the slides, you can, you can look at that later. Uh, now, we're still with water. So all this has to do with water. Because when there is land degradation through biofuel activities, there is no more water production. Many of these biofuel production sites are heavily sprayed with pesticides, so water is uh, suffering. We have rising nitrate levels, rising pesticide levels in our groundwater in Germany, very strongly. And this is a, a thing that uh, is, is impossible. And uh, now what can be done is pollution prevention to switch to other systems. So for biofuel at least not going for corn anymore, what is destructive. Corn is eating up the soil quality, and uh, there are some other plant alternatives, so like some flowers that are giving the same yield without the damage. It's not really done very much so far, but it will come, I hope. Uh, and then pollution prevention for like water pollution in wastewater. So once again, looking at uh, what could be done locally, so this is soap produced in Burkina Faso by a local community. So one person has decided, I will become a soap producer. There are many local things where you can make soap from, so like propanol oil or 
many other plant oils, and uh, it's not so difficult. My sister is making soap in Berlin. So she works with uh, with filmmaking, and she always has like two months work, night and day, and then three months off. And in that time, she's producing soap and sells it on the local market. And this doesn't have preservatives because it's sort of it's, it's sold directly, and this is preserving the water. And now we have uh, in most products on the shelves in the supermarkets, if you look at the carabines, have you ever heard that? Look at your products, it's on all, all of the uh, cosmetics, all the shampoos, everywhere. And you know what that is? These parabenes, they are hormone mimics. So if you put this on your skin, you take in a hormone mimic. And there seems to be links to cancer, <laughs> what is ignored. And this is a consequence of legislation, because at some point EU legislation was prohibiting biocides, because they were toxic. What did the industry do? They took the next more dangerous thing, because that was not regulated. And by the time we had that, regulation was not following up anymore, because now they are so shy administration is sort of not daring anymore to control, uh, to regulate and uh, so now everywhere we have the parabenes and uh, there's a lot of cases of cancer where they are found in the cells and so try to avoid this, it's not so easy. Local products wouldn't have this from the beginning because it's unnecessary, it's only necessary when you have products that want to have 10 years of shelf life. And uh, so another local product and uh, that's one thing. One more thing. In wastewater, we have a lot of problem with pharmaceutical residues. And it's a big headache, big headache in reuse system. So reuse-oriented sanitation. We have uh, pharmaceutical residues, maybe 150 different uh, synthetic substances. Some of them very, very, very difficult to uh, degrade. And this is something what is uh, also often not necessary. And uh, one example of many. So this simple plant kills malaria completely. Artemisia annua. And uh, this is something what would not pollute uh, our body, not pollute our urine, not pollute the soil, not pollute the plant. And uh, once again, it's not big business, but it could be local business. And this happens increasingly, so there are more and more groups growing this and very successfully. And uh, if you are interested in this, there's the organization Anamet. The website is anamet.net. And there's a lot of plants that are usable for uh, many, many illness. And they are often stronger than the pharmaceutical products because they are synthetic, they have sort of been produced long time ago, they are on the shelf for a year and two, um, and this is something where uh, a lot of local production can be done, at the same time protecting the water. So there are all these many links to water. And uh, now the, um, also part of health, I mentioned this already, watch out for your zinc levels and um, also look at vitamin D. Uh, so that's something what is also reducing the number of pharmaceuticals that have to be taken. So good public health means good water quality at the same time. In water management, there's something that is called uh, demand management, water demand management. So that means we use water in an efficient way. Uh, I will not go into details, just that uh, more efficient distribution system, less leakages, more efficient household installations, like these percolators at the taps, uh, and maybe other types of toilet systems. And uh, now to innovative sanitation, just a few examples. And, uh, What I do is following what industry has done very successfully. 
This was the original end of pipe system. So uh, <coughs> industry was buying lots of water, putting all into a sewerage network in the industry, and then either discharging directly into the river, but also then very often uh, treating in a uh, central plant with all the mixed wastewater. And that, that is very costly and unsuccessful because all this mix of different substances is not easy to be treated and reuse is very, very difficult. So the modern way of organizing industry, and this all costs money, and the better way to organize, and that is the standard in good industries, in, in well-managed industries, to have source control. So each production site has its own water processing that is specific, that is reusing not only water but also some substances. And this actually makes money. And those areas where there are droughts, other industries would have to close down. These ones can go on producing. And so now the question was, can the same work in housing areas? And now we have big amounts of water that we use. So what can we do with that? If we look at that, so this would be like our 120, 150 liters per capita in day. All, all the waste, all the wastewater together. What we can split into grey water and toilet wastewater. But when we consider these 150 liters or 120, uh, if we look what we really consume with all the other things, this would be this tube, 125 liters, and what we really consume, including our shoes, our car, our uh, vegetables, our cotton, cotton shirt, 4,200 liters per day. Did you know that? Maybe you remember from the other lecture, but uh, this is something we normally don't know. Maybe four cubic meters per day for us as one person. This is not very efficient. And uh, so that's linking to the issues I was telling you. Once again, looking at the rice. Why do we use so much water? Because when we buy rice, we buy rice from wet cultivation that is very wasteful with water. And there are many examples like this. So this could easily shrink to one third or less. But now the issue of uh, our direct consumption. And that is, uh, we can add value through reuse because we want to have systems that are economically viable. And uh, if we have full reuse, we have zero emissions. That's a very good connection, a win-win situation. And it often makes sense further to come to systems that don't have emissions anymore. So uh, most of the nutrients are in urine, and most of the stuff that can be converted to compost are in excreta. And excreta is very small compared to the wastewater. So these are the volumes, the gray water, water from shower, from uh, washing machine, dishwashers, and so on. Urine, very little, but almost all nutrients in there, and excreta or fecal matter itself, uh, very little uh, volume, but a lot of organic matter and phosphate and so on. And now, how, it, how can we separate this? In, and this can make products. The key issue is toilets. Unfortunately, wow. it's not a very sexy subject. <laughs> Myself, I started with uh, vacuum toilets. In uh, this settlement, we have uh, vacuum toilets collecting the wastewater to a digester, so there can be energy and fertilizer production from the toilets. And the water consumption has come down to 65 liters per capita a day. What is measured value? This is not calculated. And uh, now to go further for very water scarce areas, this is the system of uh, the black water. So uh, Uli Brown was making the invention that when we have toilet wastewater, we can collect that separately. We can process this like an in industry. We process the toilet wastewater for toilet flushing. 
most people make gray water for toilet flushing. So that's still a linear system with a little loop that is very costly, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. And uh, so this is making a closed loop system. Even a flush toilet doesn't need any fresh water. And so that's a very uh, good idea. Technically, it does work. The first installation is now done near Hofbahnhof for a public toilet. So it's around 150 people equivalent. So that's the first large-scale implementation. And suddenly there's a lot of interest from companies. So we will see more in, uh, installations of this. And uh, this has a potential to become uh, one of the standard methods of uh, sanitation. It's very cost efficient as well. So rainwater could be processed and replenishing groundwater and then even local supply would be possible in the most extreme case. Wouldn't have to be done, but uh, if we are in uh, very dry areas. And then we can come down to fresh water demands of only 10 to 20 liters per capita a day, but with everything. People have their showers, washing machines, dishwashers and everything. And uh, at the same time, this is producing uh, fertilizer and also we can make terapeutic compost from the excreta that we separate here. It's, it's not so difficult to separate the excreta in, uh, in the uh, buildings themselves. And that can make compost once again to improve soil quality. This is getting hopefully not too much, it's, it's a lot, but uh, it will be another 10 minutes maybe. Go for that? Okay. <laughs> cool. So when we look at uh, low tech, my heroes are the old Indios from the Amazon. So they were, they were probably the most sustainable society worldwide because they only left the best soil of the world plus beautiful ceramics instead of lots of waste and uh, polluted areas. And uh, the soils there were attracting many scientists to look what that was. And uh, these are their ceramics, and this is the soil. So there is uh, around 10% of this area has very, very, very rich <coughs> soil in a region where soils are normally very weathered. Tropical areas have weathered soils because there's so much rain and everything washes out. And these soils are still fertile after 500 years. And this means that uh, they have made a nice trick somehow. And the trick seems to be, partly at least, to put in charcoal. Not just ashes, but charcoal. And uh, charcoal can be done also in a, a very simple way. So this is a, a wood gas stove. And uh, you can, well, cook with that. But you don't burn the wood, but it's only uh, heated from the flame. The wood gas is coming out. and. This is becoming charcoal, and that can be added to the compost of the bio-waste or from the excreta. And this alone is a system of producing added value in the region, because producing such stoves and the fuel from the region could be also like harvesting some stuff of the moringa tree, for example, that is feeding this again, and then improving the soil with that later on. So that's uh, one of the ideas that is there. And uh, then soil could be changed from something like this to something like that. And that has been actually built on the bed soil. And it's still very, very productive today. Uh, they used such pots, and that was probably their sanitation system. So there is some indication that there was these huge pots, and they had a little hole. Uh, in, in the bottom uh, so that uh, too much liquid could run out and worms could move in so that it would uh, thoroughly compost and, but this is still a theory so we don't really know exactly but this gave us the idea to switch to lactic acid fermentation and this can even be combined with a conventional toilet ideally, ideally uh, 
collecting urine separately, but then excreta could be filtered out uh, and lactic acid bacteria would be put in. And uh, that is a very simple process to put something into lactic acid fermentation. So that's from my kitchen. I normally have this um, up there on the, on the cupboard. And when I have my kitchen waste, I have a closed bucket and I put the kitchen waste once a day and then I put some of this bacteria and it doesn't smell. It's just uh, converted to uh, lactic acid fermentation so that conserves it. So I can keep that uh, for a week, for two, for two months, three months, no problem, and then bring it to composting. And this is very easy to multiply, just add some sugar and also the trace elements, they also, every, every living thing needs that. <laughs> Strange how we ignore that. Uh, and uh, then uh, this the same can be done here with excreta. These are, these are lactic acid bacteria. Mm -hmm. And later you can have a smell, it's, it's slightly sour. And this is used in food industry a lot, so uh, sauerkraut and also some other kimchi <coughs> in Japan uh, is done with this. And it's a very nice form of conserving organic material. And then uh, composting with adding charcoal, the uh, terracotta composting. And now, how can we have sanitation in this way? And this is talking about toilets. And uh, this would be such a model now. What is the idea here? We need very little dilution, so we need a toilet that keeps clean without flushing with 10 liters. And uh, we want to have a container that is airtight, and that's what this thing can do. This is just a camping toilet from the normal. I bought this this morning, actually. It's even very stable. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's, uh, and uh, the trick here is that there is a, a little slider in here. You see that? So when we want to use that, we just open, and then we try to to hit the hole. <laughs> We're not polluting it too much. It does work <laughs> after a little bit of training. <laughs> <laughs> and if it gets dirty, what happens from time to time, or when children are on there, we simply uh, use a, a spray nozzle. Either a spray bottle if there is no tap water, but also from tap water we can have a little shower with very high pressure, or with the pressure of the tap, and this could clean it with very little water. Some water doesn't matter, but not too much, because then there will be too much dilution, too much volume. And uh, so, this toilet is normally operated with uh, toxic chemicals, what we don't like. So we put lactic acid fermenters. So before we use that, we put in half a liter of this with some sugar, so that the bacteria can also grow. Unfortunately, they don't like to grow on fecal matter. They need some additional sugar. And uh, with that, no smell. Or if there is smell, it's a slightly sour smell. It's not this disgusting fecal smell anymore. Uh, and uh, just if you if you look at uh, the big problem sanitation is posing worldwide, this is a very simple solution. It's a sanitation system. You can put this into a house, and the house has a toilet. No piping, no sewers. No vent pipes, nothing. Just some material and a service, and that's the important part. It must be part of a, a service system uh, that this is collected maybe weekly. And the challenge now, this is too small. This is for camper vans, for yachts. It's used by millionaires, so it's not really, it's, it's, it can be used easily, uh, but it's too small for like family application in households. And now the challenge is to make this uh, into something bigger. And for this we have our design award, so $50,000 can still be won. Still there is hardly any application for that, very strange. 
uh, maybe people don't have any idea how to deal with it, but even if you would just make a like enlargement of this, uh, this would be a good idea. And now collection of containers is not the best idea. This is normally detached and carried away, what could be done, but uh, <coughs> ideally it should have a larger container and a little pipe so that a suction truck could come and collect, So, or a pump could be in there, a submerged pump. So there are several possibilities. And this mustn't cost much. So this costs around 60 euros. A good sanitation system with 60 euros. This is uh, incredible. Normally you would have uh, to invest a lot of money for that. So that's uh, the, pro the usual problem when you don't have a hen and you don't have, a, have an egg. So we are in that situation with this toilet. So we, we don't have one, so we cannot really start this. But we need a large scale production to really have this available. So we are looking now for producing uh, prototypes. We work intensively on lactic acid fermentation. So these are uh, experiments in our lab. So there's uh, very good results. We have three or four lactic acid bacteria that don't produce gas and that work well in uh, uh, excreta. And uh, then, finally, some words about energy and bio waste. So the wood gas stove, the little one I showed you, is just a camping version once again, uh, easier to carry around the show. A uh, larger scale would be that one, with a website, World Stove, where you can look at that. But also, uh, <coughs> Fingers has produced these now in Senegal, uh, from an idea we developed together. And these are locally made wood gas stoves, and uh, the test families, most of them didn't want to give it back after the test phase. They said, no, 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 we want to keep it. <laughs> and that was a good sign. And so they don't need the, uh, the gas bottles anymore. No fossil fuel, renewable fuel from the region. The money they spend stays in the village. And they use the, well, the woody waste of the region. Could also be the straw of the rice plants that are grown there in, in big numbers. And uh, so that's something that works very, very nicely. And uh, that is also producing large-scale uh, charcoal for improving the soil quality. And uh, the high-tech version of that is uh, making electricity from wood gas. And this is existing, but it's still a little bit tricky because they require a lot of maintenance. So they have lots of breakdowns and you need really skilled people that you don't find so easily. <coughs> and this is a, a gasifier in, in Senegal at this farm where I told you this farmer, his soil goes bad, and now he's desperately looking for solutions. And he found a solution with this gasifier. This is your fingers. Uh, this is the gasifier. There is the, uh, the gas transportation, gas cleaning, and finally a, a gas engine, the converted diesel engine. And this makes 75 kilowatts of, of power when it works. <coughs> it doesn't work too often, unfortunately, because they don't have the skilled people to, to keep it running. But they can work, actually. There are also some in Germany. But it requires really uh, some, some uh, capacity building. And uh, besides the power and the heat that could be used, uh, there is charcoal that we use for charcoal composting. And uh, there were first experiments now, three harvests in a row, uh, just adding charcoal to the soil, and the yield was rising 30%, only from that, only from the charcoal, even without compost. And now this farmer is relieved, and uh, he thinks he has a solution for improving his soil quality, but still now we are looking for intermediate plants to in enhance the um, the biomass in soil and so on, because he wants to go organic also, and that's not so easy with the 7,000 hectares he owns, the size of the Hamburg Harbor in total. There's also a way of making charcoal uh, on the fields. The amount of, of straw that is burned worldwide is the same amount as fuel used for cooking. It's enormous, just burnt away and lost. Only the mineral is remaining, but we want the organic as well. 
And so this could be done with uh, some trick of charcoal, igniting a fire in here, putting the straw or rice husk there, and then the fire will heat the woody stuff around, and it will also give off uh, wood gas, increasing the flame, making it hotter and hotter, and when everything is black, the charcoal is ready. And this is a trick from Japan, it's called a uh, kuntan method. And bamboo could be used nicely in such systems, so that would be a way of grey water treatment. This is actually a treatment plant, very productive one in southern France. <laughs> and uh, so this is a way of um, making use of the grey water as well. And the house in Indonesia I showed you that could have that between the houses, for example. So now, to wrap up, uh, poor people's problems, very expensive water to drink, lack of food, poor health, lack of sanitation. And now one synergistic approach to solve these problems could be, if there is one problem, look for others and solve them together. It's a principle that works nicely very often. One problem is unsolvable, but when you have three or four together, it becomes very simple sometimes. So lack of efficient, low-cost sanitation, go for waterless. This addresses water scarcity, makes simple installations like this feasible. It will make a possibility for improving the soil quality, so better food security, more water renewal, making more local income and producing jobs and so this is sort of one approach how we could go for these things for some of the things i've demonstrated we need some input some industrial products like uh, a good toilet but they're also low-tech uh, versions where we don't need such installation but it's more for the rural where we have many people in urban areas it would probably have to be something like that and uh, with this i want to come to the conclusions, so water key issue, soil is the most important issue if we want to have clean water, it's the same like food security luckily, it's the same like good local climate and local income generation, so that fits together very well, uh, and uh, water and food security, we better act now, thank you very much. If you are further interested, please click on some of these uh, flickering subjects.